So welcome to this, uh, this installment of our series in book discussions of uh, where we invite principally our faculty to, uh, to speak to their recent research, but sometimes research that's just coming out. I'm calling this one Friday with Frank. Um, for those of you from my generation, and I know there are precious few of you, but uh, if, you, if, you have, if you're into North American jazz, uh, you'll recognize that reference. Um, but this is, uh, this is an EGS Friday with Frank. I'm, I'm absolutely delighted that we can do this. Uh, we'll be discussing Frank Ruta's uh, Indifference and Repetition, um, an exciting book, part of a, of a, of a, a, a quite uh, powerful and important project. And uh, it's just wonderful that uh, Frank can join us to talk about this. And also we have um, a wonderful group of uh, respondents um, I'm going to be rapid, as I, as I always am. I'm, I'm going to uh, presume that uh, our auditors are familiar with the, um, the EGS faculty who are present. And in this case, we have uh, Rebecca Kome. It's delightful to have Rebecca back. Uh, Maladen Dullar. Um, we have Slaboy Zizek. And of course, uh, Frank Ruda. Um, the, the one person who is not, uh, has not been regularly with us is uh, Christoph Menke, and I want to give him a special um, uh, welcome and, and, and also thanks. Let me say just a couple words about Christoph. He's, he's written extensively in uh, uh, philosophical, uh, uh, philosophical text, critical theory, um, philosophy of art. Um, I'm just going to read a couple titles for you. The Sovereignty of Art, Aesthetic Negativity After Adorno and Derrida, 1998. Reflections uh, of Equality, 2006. Tragic Play, Tragedy, Irony, and Theater from Sophocles to Beckett, 2009. Force, A Fundamental Concept of Aesthetic Anthropology, 2012. Law and Violence, uh, Christopher Menke and Dialogue, 2018. And then Critique of Rights, 2020. So you see we're dealing with a forbidding um, and exhausting <laughs> list of very important works. And uh, it, it's it's just wonderful to have uh, Christoph with us. And so welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we will, I, I want to move quickly because we do have a, a quite significant uh, group of speakers. And let me just say, uh, uh, in terms of our, of our protocol, our, our way, way of proceeding this afternoon, um, Frank Ruda will give 10 to 15 minute um, introduction I'm gonna say, to get us warmed up. Um, then Rebecca Kame will, will follow uh, with, with remarks, um, roughly 12 minutes. Um, Maladen Delar will follow after that. Third in order is Christoph Menke. And then following uh, Christoph will be Slavoj Zizek. And then Frank will respond. So you'll see that we are um, unfortunately in a rather tight uh, um, framework. I, this is probably going to run just a little bit over an hour and a half. Um, I hope that will be um, okay for, for the people present. Um, I think that the, the contributions will all be finished within an hour and a half and, um, and then, then Frank will respond. So with that, let me, uh, let me pass the screen immediately to Rebecca, or excuse me, to Frank. And, uh, and he could get us started. Um, Frank, again, thank you so much. Also, I want to thank two people before you start. I, I want to thank Heather Young. I don't know if Heather is here. I uh, the names of, there's so many names and they're going by fast. I haven't been able to see if she's present with us, but uh, if she is welcome, Heather, and thanks. Um, none of us can know quite how significant your presence is here uh, because we're, we're doing this in English, but uh, you, you've made this possible, I think, in terms of this, uh, the, the presence of the book in English. And Heather, thank you very much. Um, also, Nemanja Mitrovic is in the background helping um, with the technical support of this, as always. And I should remind us that this idea of book discussions was Nemanja's. So thanks to Nemanja. Um, OK, with that, uh, Frank, if you could get started. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks very much, Chris. And I, I, I first want to thank everyone involved with this event, um, especially, I mean, EGS, that is. Uh, <clears throat> from my side, uh, obviously, uh, uh, Chris and Emania, and I'm, I'm, I'm deeply grateful. Um, and um, the four thinkers that will speak after me, and it is a real honor and pleasure to have such wonderful and amazingly anxifying, I say, uh, a set of interlocutors and friends virtually here with me and us today. And I want to thank them, first of all, um, actually for ruining their Friday evening with me. Um, 
uh, it might be a good uh, test and or proof and both of friendship or the end of it. But we will see how probably that evening goes. I want to say a few words about the book <clears throat> whose release offers us the occasion for our discussion today in difference and repetition, a title that was born, um, I remember, in a very late night uh, conversation with my friend Aaron Schuster, who used it in uh, his book on um, on uh, Lacan and Deleuze a while back, and just very, very recently made its appearance into the English-speaking world with Fordham University Press in a quite revised and uh, transformed form that, that Heather Young um, um, wonderfully and, and and made possible. I'm not able to, and I do not want to even attempt to recap the contents of the book in the brief opening statement of mine. Rather, what I thought I should do is to make three additional or supplementary remarks about the book. And the first concerns its enemies. The second concerns the crucial operation it seeks to understand. And the third remark concerns its place in what I consider to be my wider systematic and philosophical project. So it concerns what is therefore to come to be expected and yet to be developed and not yet not yet there. So let me begin with the enemies. Um, I realized when preparing for today what it seems to have well, it seems to have quite a few. Book seems to have quite a few enemies. The book tries to set up or set up or prepare the groundwork for um, a concept of freedom, for what a concept of freedom might look like, and it does this via negativa negatively, and the kind of critique it ventures to formulate is one that on the one hand side opposes a problematic form of dualism. I think there are good forms of dualism uh, that one should defend, but there is clearly also a problematic form of dualism. And the problematic form of dualism is one where we explain freedom as immaterial or non-material. So we, we explain it in in an esoteric way, or in a way that is metaphysically, in classical terms, idealist. We would then take freedom to simply be non-material, immaterial, or something that, in a sense, we have. We possess one way of rendering this, and this is what, what I address as, or call the ideology of freedom, it's to say it's a capacity. Something that we're equipped with, and that is actual, even if not actualized, that is somehow there, but um, 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 uh, not localizable. So in, in, in a sense, we're always already free from that perspective, but we naturalize freedom because we think freedom is a, a essential component of uh, the human the human life form. Um, my point or the point of the book, and um, I, I mobilize um, the tradition of uh, 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 modern rationalism, is to say that freedom's naturalization is ultimately its misunderstanding, or to put it more pathetically, its annihilation. This means conceptually that freedom is not something that cannot be thought or explained or needs to be explained away. This brings onto the stage a second set of enemies, and these enemies are the vulgar materialists of the strict determinants. They assume freedom is nothing but a user's illusion, so to speak. So if we had the appropriate resources, such a position would claim, we, would, we could entirely explain what actually determined our actions or us having made this or that decision. So either we explain the way that's the metaphysical idealism, or we basically assume that uh, um, the materialism over-determines um, 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 is, is providing us with a framework that allows us to understand freedom ultimately, which would mean that also psychic causality, to use this psychoanalytic concept, is reducible to the one type of causality that governs everything. My conceptual answer to this issue at the end of the day is to split determinism into two, to show how causality must be split into two, or that there need to be what psychoanalysis calls psychic causality, a causality different from physical causality. This means that we have to integrate, I think, into um, or start conceptualizing our concept of freedom, and this is unavoidable, moments of foundational heterodetermination, moments of us being determined by things happening to us, events, to speak like but you for a moment. Freedom, in short, is linked to eventality. Why there is thus what Jean-Luc Nancy once called an experience of freedom is because there are moments, I would venture to say, sequences of freedom, and it might even be good um, that we're not 
free all the time, it would be quite demanding to decide all the time on the very crucial factors and orientations of our lives, um, that there is something something um, determining us in, in, in those moments. We are thus, I'm citing Slavoj here, simultaneously is less free and more free than we think. Um, the problematic side of this was articulated as um, I think Christoph Menke has shown um, in, in, in very impressive ways by Levinas at one point where, where when, when Levinas speaks about the creation of the very soul of the slave, um, so the, the soul of the slave is, um, um, is, in, is, is making the slave feel free and the most efficient slave is the slave who believes that he or she is free. That's an insight that already, I think, as Rebecca uh, Kumei has argued, um, um, uh, like, like, uh, I think very, very uh, convincingly, um, um, uh, that, that this is an insight that already already Hegel um, 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 has articulated um, um, in um, uh, the phenomenology of spirit when he talks about, when he comes out of the, uh, the discussion of the master-servant um, um, dialectic. What the book on the indifference that we're talking about today indicates, and just to say it as clearly as possible, is that indifference is what results from the idea that freedom is a given that freedom is something that's natural to human beings. So in short, what I call the ideology of freedom is what makes us believe that we're simply free by means of our nature, that we have freedom to indifferently decide whatever we can. In different terms, what I think one has to argue for, and we're here moving um, on to the second remark I wanted to make, is that the moment we naturalize freedom, freedom is lost. Or to put it differently, when we naturalize freedom, and this is what I mean by saying that it is a given or a capacity or something that we just have, we substantialize it. It is lost when we naturalize it, even if this means we thereby spiritualize it in the sense of making it a natural component of spirit. There is a persistent naturalization of freedom that is part and parcel of the existing social, economic, and political conditions. And there is a I think a whole line of that naturalization that runs from thinkers like Descartes, Kant, through Hegel, uh, up to Marx, that that uh, and and thinkers like Heidegger who think uh, who claim that there is an uh, a form of a almost like an ontological um, um, a regression or reduction taking place, um, whereby uh, human beings act as if they were animals. If, if 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 that happens, and that does not simply mean that we're simply acting like ants, but the the animals uh, um, uh, that we're acting as are uh, themselves products of a uh, uh, of an organization of culture <laughs> to my mind the flag it carries so the flag that the um um, um that the naturalization of uh, freedom carries along is that of the possible so what i'm trying to argue is that the possible that which is derived from the sum, uh, assumption that we have a form of freedom as our natural possession is actually against its um, uh, immediate, most immediate um, uh, impression and oppressive category. Something that restrains thought and action. Ontic indifference thus manifests in the form of being governed and determined by possibility. The argument I developed not in indifference and repetition, but in the log logical sequence book, Abolishing Freedom, so my project, I lay my cards on the table, is an abolitionist one, um, um, in the sense in which Marx and Engels's project was an abolitionist project, uh, as they indicated in the Communist Manifesto, that it's about the abolition of the bourgeois interpretation of freedom, is that one therefore has to move from ontic indifference that I take to manifest in the assumption that freedom is a natural capacity that we're endowed with to ontological indifference. Ontological indifference consists in the assumption that freedom is that we do not have, is what we do not have, and we do not even have an idea of what we're missing. It is my an attempt to speak like, but you again to divide what is obscure, so to speak, um, that's a line from his theory of the subject. And if freedom is obscure or has become what I call a signifier of disorientation, one has to rigidly divide it to produce some minimal form of orientation. Where is this going to end? I think with an articulation of courage. I start the indifference book with a quote from Heidegger, even a problematic Heidegger of the Black Notebooks, which I nevertheless think is pertinent and crucial. 
He there says that the strange planetary indifference that has overcome mankind and is linked to the forgetting of being, uh, of the meaning of being, is one that generates what he calls das Mutlose, the absence of purge. The reason for this is that the present organization of life is one that does not allow for any form of encountering, I think that's Heidegger's argument, anxiety proper. So we have all kinds of fears, and there's even an omnipresence of fears, but there's never a form of ground-shaking anxiety that would make a difference, that would constitute a difference. I want to take up the idea that courage is somehow something that denaturalizes. Courage then would be a name for denaturalization against the idea of freedom as natural capacity, but also against the idea that there is that there just is something else than nature, something that spirit is just a given, um, that there is just an other of nature that we consider to be a given already, right? I mean, that, that spirit is just there. Since spirit, for, for Hegel, um, is only what it makes of itself, and this is what I would like to endorse as well. So spirit is not simply there. Spirit is what makes itself. So the, the, the difference to nature is something that needs to be established. This then would mean, and I'm that's my last three sentences, uh, that assuming the ontico indifference, traversing the fantasy of freedom as capacity to freedom as being something that is externally heteronomically constituted and thus being at the same time what constitutes us as those um, who have um, freedom not in our power, but are um, 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 forced to be free, if one could make this argument, we could move from a naturalized uh, freedom, indifference and freedom as natural capacity, to spiritual freedom, the assumption that freedom is constituted without us being its authors, but with us being forced to author it, um, to uh, ultimately logical freedom. Um, the courage to assume that even the form in which we denaturalize needs to be denaturalized. You see, I'm toying with Hegel here, right? I mean, nature, spirit, logic, that's my idea. Um, it would be working with the anxiety that's produced by ontological indifference. I, I hope that, that this makes sense. Um, um, so we would move from natural freedom, naturalized freedom, to spiritual, spiritualized freedom, to logical freedom. This is a project. But for now, we're knee-deep knee deep in indifference, ontic. Thank you, Frank. Thank you so much. Um, and with that, I'll pass the screen to Rebecca. Sorry. Uh, so uh, that was a bit unfair, Frank, because you just added a whole bunch more. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I actually do just have a few questions. Um, and um, I hope you take them as as that they're genuine questions, not <laughs> nothing more than that. Um, so this is uh, this is my most neutral question. Um, I was really surprised, you know, after the reading, looking at the title of the book with its uh, um, man, uh, <clears throat> or parent, it's a parent job at, at Deleuze. I was I was actually expecting something very different when I opened the book. Um, and I, I just, I don't know if you have, if there is a silent anti delusionism here. Um, what I was expecting when I, you know, saw the cover of this book was I was thinking of Deleuze's anti-Hegelian antics uh, um, and how, you know, Deleuze speaking for and with an entire generation of post-68 anti-Hegelian philosophers of difference. Um, you know, how Deleuze famously endorsed difference against negativity, contradiction, all these Hegelian bad things. Um, so I was expecting actually the dialectical Hegelian repost to all that, showing how a philosophy of difference actually becomes indifferent or or something like that. But that's not that's not what I what I found here. Um, so um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's a it's a it's a good title, but I'm I'm just wondering if it's doing more work than than I found in this book. Um, and my second surprise was I was just actually a little bit um, shocked <laughs> in a good way, of course, um, by, 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 by this unflinching, unapologetic, uh, like full throttled affirmation and commitment to 
the modern enlightenment project to a rational um, modernity, which needs to, which finds its dignity by incessantly defending and defining itself against the incessant resurgence of myth and the this kind of tireless forensic, I mean, what what you identify and and contribute to is, you know, this tireless forensic hunting down exposure, chasing, banishing, conquering. I think you yourself use the word expulsion um, of every do residue of myth um, where uh, in this case, myth is not the, you know, old fashioned kind, but a variation of the Salarzian myth of the given, and specifically what you've already talked about, the givenness of, of freedom, the, the myth of the ideology of the givenness of freedom as a capacity, as an inalienable but yet alienated possession, as a natural condition, something which is naturalized and thus um, inherently unfree. So um, myth is the philosophy of freedom as a capacity, which is you argue ideological in that it's a it's a packaging of unfreedom as freedom, an indifferent freedom, an arbitrary freedom, a freedom of indifference, um, indifference to the material conditions of unfreedom, i.e., a kind of stoicism, a slave ideology, an illusory freedom, an empty freedom of of choice within a universe of indifferent things to choose between, i.e. commodities, and so on. Um, so all that is, you know, all that is this version of of um of of the of enlight of an enlightenment attack on on myth. Um and um I just uh yeah I was I was I was I was surprised by the by the heroism <laughs> and the bravado of this manifesto like declamation here and I'm kind of scared to see what your third volume on courage is is going to be <laughs> um were it not for I mean I would find it scary were it not for the meticulous almost loving patience and detail with which you read and the solidarity you know that you find in the in the tradition of modern philosophy so even if myth as the myth of the given, the given here being uh, the given of freedom, turns out, you know, so th this myth must be, this, this is a myth busting, even if the myth in question, um, the relationship to myth, myth is a more complex one than normal old ideological critique or enlightenment critique of myth would, um, would, would, would assume. So even if the myth of givenness and the givenness of the givenness that is myth turns out to be um, not simply the enemy of um, or the thing to be banished by modernity, but the retroactive production of and by modernity itself, which constitutes itself um, among other things as the essentially as the the inaugural act of overcoming myth specifically the myth of the given and the specifically the givenness of freedom and so on. So um, the dialectic here, the sly one is not the expected one of the dialectic of enlightenment, be it Hegel's or Adorno's of, of, of modernity. It's not just about modernity degenerating or degrading into myth and therefore, although it's also that, um, and therefore stuck in this kind of endless loop or repetition compulsion of I ideology, um, which must turn into ideology critique, auto critique, meta ideology critique, critique of ideology critique, and, and so on. So this sort of endless, endless sort of bad infinite spiral. Um, so modernity is not simply regressing into pre-modernity, what you call pre-history, but it's generating the very idea and possibility of pre-modernity against which it defines and defends itself, which also suggests, or or this is the danger, I think, that that this, this all might be an act of shadow boxing, um, that the, the, the very heroism um, that's needed to prosecute and persecute myth is itself a you know is itself a production um, of myth uh, of of a mythical modernity itself. Um, so all this smacks of repetition compulsion, but you also do hint of another kind of 
repetition. And I, I'm interested to hear more of that. I mean, you speak about somewhat, you speak about a patient repetition in which I also hear kind of heroic, I'm sorry, repetition by modernity of its inaugural act of disenchantment. So this repeated self uh, affirmation, reaffirmation, but also a self affirmation of modernity by modernity in which we also hear at the very end, um, which is to say proleptically, but here's the sneaky thing, um, retrospectively, because you're looking forward here in this book to a book that's that's already written. Um, so to, to what you call another kind of indifference, the kind of, um, or this is what worried me, a kind of, what's, what sounded, um, you were very, very quick in those last pages, like a kind of meta indifference, which is able to become indifferent to the very ideology of, of indifference. I mean, you speak of a profane in this context or disenchanted fatalism. Um, so one sidebar question, and then I want to get to, to, to my real question. Is there possibly a myth of the, the ungiven, um, the idea that freedom is not actually a given, but, but something to be wrestled and at wrangled, um, we're not born, must become free, we're condemned to freedom. And do we end up in a in a kind of bad infinite of endless self-emancipation? Or is that just the flip side of the of the same thing? So my 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 real question, how much time have I just used up? Um Rebecca, if I'm not uh, mistaken, you you've been going about nine minutes. Oh, okay, well, okay. Um <clears throat> Okay, well, I'm going to need a few more, I think. Oh, that's fine. Um, okay. Um, so my, my, my main question was, um, I'd like you to historicize, I'd like to ask you to historicize a little more. Um, because this full throttled endorsement of modernity that you are um, unambivalently um, affirming, a modernity which in its maturity, that is to say, after Hegel forever, needs and has to and must um, and is able to historicize itself. So the context, which is which means that the context, uh, it takes a long time to get there. That's why I'm, I mean, in your book, that's why I um, wanted to pause at it. The context and therefore the object of, of a fully modern critique, despite them, you know, notwithstanding its inevitable regressions, is thus capitalism as an organized system for the production of indifference on a global scale. So the critique of the ideological critique of freedom as um, ultimately indifferent and indifferent freedom is forci becomes forcibly a, a critique of capitalism. I mean, this is this is just um, in, inexorable if you're going to take modernity seriously. So it's capitalist modernity um, in the end that's wedded to and sustained by the myth of the given. And also that reveals the more than simply theoretical or simply philosophical stakes of this project, um, or to put it more precisely, capitalism is the is what is what shows abstraction to be you know as Unreal calls real abstraction, um, material let us say materially embodied in the abstract, um, indifferent. Um, because exchangeable working body of the worker who sells um, his or her own abstract and different labor time freely entering <clears throat> into a contract in which the owner owns your time uh, for a while and more than a while, if we include the unpaid time necessarily to arrive at work on time every day, da, 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 da. Okay, so in the service, all this abstract labor going into the production of commodities, which themselves are indifferent, exchangeable goods, despite and because of their sparkle of particularity, which makes you want to need to always buy more of them, even though they're the same. So in the new preface, um, that's how you end the book, uh, more or less. Um, very, very quickly like, with a, a romp through Marx. And I just I just want to hear more of it. Um, in the preface for the what, what I consider the American market, but let's just say the Anglophone market. Um, and um, don't take this, don't take this badly, but I always, to be honest, roll my eyes a little bit when a guy supplements his book on dead white men with a gesture to feminism and critical race theory. 
Um, and I confess I had, I did have that ungenerous reaction when I, when I started, um, you know, uh, hearing you talk about Sylvia Federici and Ang Angela Davis and so on. So, so on one hand, you, you, you absolutely, I mean, this is, this is needed. I mean, this, this move to social reproduction theory, um, and how, in, in order to show how under capitalism, the, the worker's so-called freedom is, um, as relegated to free time, um, is doubly compromised. First, freedom from work is always in the service of work. It's always about recharging the batteries so that you can reproduce, you know, yourself, so you can get to get back to work. Um, but second, and and um, equally, if not more importantly, that this freedom is propped up by the invariably gendered unfreedom of others, the invisible unpaid labor, cooking, cleaning, raising, and literally propagating um, as an unpaid sex worker, workers for the future. Um, in the second move, you talk about um, abolitionism and the way in which slavery is occluded, continuing ongoing slavery is occluded by the very discourse of abolition itself. I mean, I would personally have looked at the prison industrial complex here rather than simply at the wage slavery of the, you know, of the factory worker, but that's another conversation. But this is this is where I'm hoping for further historicization. Um, to, 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 to think about the new forms of freedom and therefore the, that, that's just the new forms of mythical freedom generated under the pressures of contemporary neoliberal capitalism rather than this old fashioned capitalism and this old fashioned social reproduction that, you, that, that you're addressing. In the preface, you make a gesture to the global, a Marxist gesture to the global reach of capitalism. Um, but I think this requires um, a modification or complication of the social reproduction theory of the of 1970s feminism um, to which you refer, but also a modification of the Marxist account of the abstract freedom embodied in the laboring body. So first, um, you know, the modification of social reproduction theory, um, I'm talking, you know, specifically about how, um, you know, this is no longer the seventies. We have, we have a division of labor, but we have we have the outsourcing of social reproduction to care workers who are imported. Obviously, a terrible pay from the global south. So you have this, at at first glance, paradoxical um, situation, but actually not um, of, of white middle class women exploiting women, usually of color, to clean and tend their kids in the kitchen and to perform the emotional labor of loving their kids, um, often at the expense of the kids actually left at home um, who, who need the paycheck. Um, this is what Federici herself actually refers to in more recent, not 70s writing, but more recent writings as the uh, new international division of, of labor. Um, but also the, so so um, I think we, we can't talk about social reproduction without talking about that. Um, but also the reproductive labor silently penetrating the workplace itself. And we need look no further than our own workplace here, which is both, you know, the manifestly gendered aspect of it, but the uh, not really um, ungendered. And I'm referring not only to the still largely gendered division of labor, the effective labor service with a smile performed by um, so many service workers, um, and not just the unpaid emotional labor performed by, by some, not all, by some every second of the day in the institutions of cognitive labor which we inhabit. And I, I do, if I, if I have to stress the emphatically gendered aspect of the emotional labor that we, um, as women academics, perform, if I have to stress that, this just underscores the fact of its invisibilization, both as labor and as female labor. Um, but also, and I'm, I am kind of finished up here, the compulsory effective labor incumbent on everybody, that is to say the pressure, not only to do your job, but to love your job, <laughs> that we have to, we actually have to love what, we, what we're doing. We do it because we love it. So the kind of bureaucratic romanticism built into the neoliberal university is what I'm referring to, this weird investment of work in of work that we don't we don't identify as laborers. 
we're part of a guild, we don't want to unionize. Um, so there's this idealization of our work as a, as, a, as a vocation. You love it so much that you just can't stop doing it. Oh my God, I found my best ideas when I'm working in the shot, when I'm taking a bath and so on and so forth. Um, I'm focusing on the university for the moment, just because this is where, you know, some of us, a lot of us come from. Um, because uh, these are supposedly and still could be loci, loci, loci of emancipatory critique. Um, and simultaneously a place where the capitulation to market forces is most insidious and obscured. Um, but just to, to end here, let's um, lest you think I'm just talking about kind of high-end um, mythification. Um, can you talk about freedom, mythic freedom under capitalism without talking um, without without it, talking about the age of we're living in the age of of zero hour contracts. That's actually a, a thing. A zero hour contract. I mean it's a it's a contradiction in terms, but that's the way the gig economy, works. So um, I'm talking about Uber, Uberification, this incredible freedom, like you're free to choose, you're free to decide when to work, i.e. you have to be always on the ready to work. It's not even a nine to five contract, it's a zero hour, which means a 24 hour contract and so on. There's no boss, there's just an algorithm, there's no workplace no juggling of the work-life balance because work and life have become indistinguishable. Is this the, the I, I close here, is this the same mythic structure um, and as the, um, as the myth of, uh, as, as the continuing mythology of, of, of modern capitalism in its classic form? Or is there something about late capitalism for which the instruments of critique um, have to be have to be changed or finessed or something? That's so. I. I, I that's poor that. Frank won't be able to respond immediately. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rebecca. That's very very rich and, and very powerful. And. I'll, I'll leave it to Frank to put down a, uh, a couple sentences for the end. Um, but thank you, thank you, that, 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 that's terrific. Um, we move then to uh, Miladin uh, for the next um, intervention. Thank you very much, Miladin. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, um, I cannot start otherwise by, than by praise of this, uh, of this book and by stressing the urgency of the topic. Uh, this Frank's book is uh, an accompanying volume to the other book, Abolishing Freedom, published uh, mm. eight years ago, which gained considerable reputation. And together they form a magisterial diptych, a dearly needed stroke in the debates about the viability of freedom and a profound philosophical research into the presuppositions of the very concept of freedom and its contemporary credibility. And to this, I just add, one can add uh, Slavoj's book, Freedom, a Disease Without a Cure, which was published a few months ago. So Frank's new book comes with the publication date of 2024, inaugurating this new year, 2024. And as we enter it, one can say that this is the new year that perhaps offers the bleakest prospects compared to any new year in the course of our lives. So this is a time when the prospect of freedom or the talk of any project of emancipation seems to stand against enormous odds. With the world ridden with bloody wars, the acute prospect of environmental catastrophes and the seemingly irresistible rise of right-wing populisms and more. So speaking of freedom seems a desperate enterprise more than at any time in recent memory. And what is the cure that Frank's books offer to counteract this disastrous state of affairs? Paradoxically, not. There is hope uh, freedom would eventually nevertheless prevail, but rather, let's espouse fatalism. Apocalypse has already happened. Things are already irretrievably lost. This is a quote. Everything is screwed up. So this is our best bet to start from here. And Frank's two books, published eight years apart, 
come in an inverted order for the second one actually spells out the press positions of the first one or provides a detailed reading of a larger philosophical field of modern philosophy in which the question of freedom and fatalism as its counterpart is raised. At the core of both books, there is the strong thesis that Frank doesn't tire of repeating, and indeed it should be assistedly repeated, in order to be properly remembered and thoroughly worked through, to use uh, Freud's parlance, the thesis is simple and far-reaching in its simplicity. Freedom is not a capacity that, uh, that one can possess, nor a feature that pertains to being human, as opposed to nature, which is determined by causality and necessity. It's not a potentiality that one should actualize, nor something that can be postulated. So this is what he calls the myth of the givenness of freedom and the, the, the ideology of freedom, the naturalization and substantializing of freedom. And as opposed to this, freedom is, I quote, nothing to which one might ever hold fast, nothing to which one ever could refer, and nothing that may ever be our capacity, end of quote. So the ideology of freedom is something that particularly pertains to modernity and underlies the era of capitalism, which very proudly put freedom on its banner. It's in the name of freedom that it could be distinguished it, it, it distinguished itself from the relation to pre-modern age, which was marked by slavery of different kinds. Freedom was the first of the three slogans of the French Revolution, the most salient demarcation of the new era. And the paradox is that the era which was supposed to bring liberation actually invented new forms of slavery in the name of freedom or in the form of freedom, and precisely through the ideology of freedom, enabling new forms of enslavement. And capitalism is famously based on the list of freedoms, like the freedom of choice, to start with, the free market, the freedom of enterprise, and the freedom of opinion. And this latter is particularly symptomatic, given that philosophy started by drawing this sharp divide between docs and episteme, between the regime of opinions and the regime of knowledge. And one could say that there is freedom of opinion, there can be no freedom of truth. Freedom of opinion is synonymous with indifference to truth. All these freedoms that constitute the core of liberal democratic capitalist ideology have their flip side precisely in indifference. There can be freedom of opinions because they ultimately they are ultimately indifferent. Freedom of choice is premised on indifference for what one can choose from. And the commodity form, and this is the Marxian way of speaking about it, is precisely a global regime of neutralization, a form of indifferentiation in and through the seeming proliferation of differences, of indifferent differences, it amounts to a globalization of indifference. Now, the three major philosophers, Descartes, Kant, and Hegel, to whom the three central chapters are devoted, the three arguably greatest proponents of modernity, are here taken not as an overt or covered advocates of this ideology of freedom, but at its harshest critics, whose projects depended on dismantling this ideology of freedom at its core. And what Frank uh, convincingly shows is that this engagement with the myth of the givenness of freedom actually stands at the very core of their thought. So they, the three archetypal bourgeois philosophers, are taken as the best allies in the critique of this freedom premised on an entailing indifference, although they do this by very different means. As Frank shows in great detail and with tenacious perspicacity. It's to them one should turn for the best weapons of critique of the ideology of freedom, which constitutes which the framework of capitalism. Now, the major claim of these two books is that this indifference is not to be countered by the insistence on difference, that against a quote, against the dominant form of indifferentiation one needs to emphasize difference and that which is non-identical, end of quote. And one can surmise in this very terse formulation, the thinkers as different as uh, Adorno, Heidegger, Deleuze, Derrida, uh, I wish perhaps that Frank could say more about, uh, I mean, he never, this is not a polemical book against them, um, but uh, they, they, it's implied in, in a way. So rather one would have to, uh, I quote, one would have to oppose the dominant form of organizing indifference 
with another type of indis indifference. And this is where the difference between the ontic and the ontological indifference comes in. And it, if the book's title is sort of polemically caught uh, on and the counters Deleuze's difference the petition, then the notion of ontological indifference is well in direct opposition to Heidegger, to Heidegger's endless notion of ontological difference. It turns out that um, we are not indifferent enough, or that we are indifferent in all the wrong places, or that we are indifferent because we lack the courage for the proper indifference. So what would be the good contemporary use of indifference? And I cannot resist here quoting a passage where he be most prominently, uh, a passage that Frank doesn't use to my knowledge, uh, that most prominently brings up the question of indifference and it could be conceived as ontological indifference. Namely, after a notoriously terse and mind-boggling beginning of logic, the three paragraphs of being, nothing, and becoming, Hegel wants to give some context to this austerity and counter some common sense objections. And thus, in the first remark that follows, he brings up, among other things, Kant's criticism of the ontological proof of God's existence, the question whether determinate existence can follow from the mere concept. And he takes up uh, the popular version of Kant's argument, which deals with the problem in what way the imagined hundred dollars may differ or not from the existing hundred dollars. And there he will pursue, I quote, the human being ought to raise his mind to the abstract universality to which it is in fact indifferent, gligutic to him, whether the hundred dollars, whatever the quantitative relation that they might have to his financial state, are or are not, just as it would be indifferent to him whether he himself is or is not, that is, whether he is or is not in finite life or if something else is or is not, and so on. And this is then, he gives a Latin quote, si fractus illabatur orbis in pavidum feriant ruina. A Roman once said, and still more, ought the Christian to find himself in this state of indifference. End of quote. So this Latin quote, providing the punchline, stems from Horace, who in the third ode depicts this hero, undaunted even by the collapse of the entire universe around him. It literally means, if the world should break in pieces around him, the ruins would leave him undaunted. And I'll just make three brief points about this quote that would demand much longer development. First, the passage implies like an apocalypse, not as an impending catastrophe at the end of times, but rather as the universal ruin that conditions and frames the very beginning, inaugurating thought which has to proceed indifferent against this avalanche of ruins. So an apocalypse has to happen as the precondition of proper thought, producing a complete indifference not only to one's possessions, and one could add including the capacity of freedom conceived as a possession, but to one's own existence and the existence of the world, indifference to both having and being. And second, the very act of thought is not merely a theoretical move say, a process of abstraction from all particular finite and determinate beings in order to arrive at considering being as such, but involves a practical decision, a resolve, a resolution, a pull for a stance, which is as much theoretical as practical in the same go. So, a resolution of indifference. What has to sever the ties into all particular beings, the possible use of benefit or harm, and disentangle oneself so as to come to the point of Horace's hero of ontological indifference as, say, in ethics of thought, a decision for theory to be possible. And one has, first of all, to disentangle oneself from oneself. And the phenomenology was a long and elaborate process of doing precisely this, from zweifel the doubt to verzweiflung, to despair. So there is not an I who thinks and therefore is but rather a being divorced from an eye, but not without a subject, which coincides with the decision, decision to think. And third, there's a wonderful move in this passage, a quick slide from the question of augmenting or diminishing one's possession 
with the infamous hundred dollars, sort of the translation of the question of this ontological proof of God into capitalist terms, a slide to the ontological quest, and Hegel delightfully puts into brackets, brackets quite apart from such financial situations in which the possession of a hundred dollars will in fact be a matter of indifference. Uh, so here have, we have precisely this ontic indifference, la laterally capitalist indifference of uh, the wrong kind based on possession and its immediate counterpart in ontological indifference. And anyway, I, I couldn't I couldn't resist invoking this passage in Hegel as a possible way of conceiving the necessity of ontological indifference for the impossible task of modern philosophy. And this is only hinted at in Frank's book. And since ontological indifference inevitably evokes Heidegger, one should perhaps extend this notion by saying that this ontological indifference blurs the lines of the Heideggerian ontological difference. Perhaps one should push it so far as to say to be indifferent precisely to the ontic ontological difference and divide. I know that the two books as a diptych are actually part of a proposed trilogy, awaiting the third part, which will deal with courage. And Frank was speaking about this in his initial uh, presentation. And we are all, of course, eagerly expecting the continuation. This is just my small inkling of what this could be, what could mean courage for the present. And so as not to stay with the heavy-going philosophical instance, I can conclude this with a vintage literary one, which is uh, the work of Samuel Beckett. Isn't his entire oeuvre devoted to just this one end, the progressive espousal of ontological indifference, embodied in the dire circumstances of his characters and in, as, in the very practice of his writing, the writing of reduction to the minimum, the writing of proper indifference to be countered, uh, to, to counter the indifference brought about by the, the ideology of freedom. So from Hegel to Beckett, in Yakumpa, there is only a step. <clears throat> and indeed, Frank ends his preface with the wonderful quote from The Unnameable. I quote, I see nothing, it's because there is nothing, or because I have no eyes, or both, that makes three possibilities to choose from. And one can say there is hardly any literary work that would show this complete indifference to political matters. It all happens in completely abstract places and times, yet perhaps hardly any other work that would more urgently demand political consequences that borrow from such a stuff, this courage for, of the present. And I'll stop here. I already surpassed my time. Mm. Thank you so much, Milan. Very rich. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we will. Uh, I, I, one wants to pause to savor these things, and, and I'm very embarrassed to push on. But we do need to push on. So, um, Christoph, if if you are ready, we'll ask you to take the next. Sure. Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, I feel the same. So I would like to to say something on. What Mladen presented, but uh, I I cannot do this now. So um, uh, we have already heard about the critique that the book develops freedom as indifference. Is freedom reduced uh, to a given possibility, and this means nothing but or is equal to the permanent production of unfreedom? So I share that criticism. So I won't uh, try to reconstruct it here, but I think that one can see in Frank's book. Uh, which is a discussion, as we already heard, of mo of, the, of modern philosophical rationalism, which is in a sense the same as modern philosophy, that there are two ways of, different ways of understanding this criticism. That one could maybe say that modern philosophy or rationalism bears within itself two different ways of understanding the critique of indifference, and that also means of understanding the very idea of critique. It seems to me crucial, at least it was important for me, uh, for understanding Frank's project to clearly distinguish between the two ways of understanding it. And that, that will therefore first recall one understanding of this critique and then uh, distinguish Frank's own strategy from it. And then the question, of course, would be if I understand him correctly. So let me begin. The first understanding 
criticizes the conception of freedom as a possibility or capacity in the name of capacity. This first understanding freedom as a capacity forgets exactly that. It forgets what a capacity is. For what is a capacity? A capacity is the general disposition to do something <coughs> specific, some X. If I can do X, I can produce instances of X in suitable situations. But obviously, this definition is not enough. A capacity that is more specifically a capacity which we can call spiritual or practical or subjective, whatever terminology you want to use, um, as a capacity to do something always implies the capacity not to do it. Every capacity is the capacity of the opposite, as Aristotle says. Differently put, every capacity is at the same time the capacity to actualize, actualize the capacity or not to actualize it. The capacity is the capacity of the capacity. Capacity, we also could say, is self-reflective. According to this view, the reflective capacity to actualize or not is what we truly should call freedom. Yeah, that one could say is the Aristotelian perspective, the true freedom of choice. This argument thus reformulates the freedom of choice, but it understands it, so the freedom of choice that is criticized by, by Frank uh, uh, and in the modern philosophy in his reading, but it understands differently from the bourgeois ideology of indifference. For the argument states that the freedom of choice is derivative. Only if I have the capacity to, to do X, I, do I also have the capacity not to do it. That is, I have the capacity to do or not to do X. Having possibilities, and thus also the possibility of being able to choose between them, thus presupposes having capacity, following this argument. It presupposes the reality of practical capacities. Being able to choose is therefore secondary, grounded in something else. It is grounded in being able to act. Hannah Arendt puts it like this, power comes before freedom. Or well, freedom is essentially power, namely the ability to act, practical capacity, practical power. So if the freedom of choice, this strategy would say, is understood correctly, i.e. as derivative, then it is also no longer, longer a mere possibility. The bourgeois ideology of freedom says, I'm free if I have the possibility to act this way or that way or not. Probably understood that objection, would, uh, the argument would say, However, this means I'm free if I have the capacity to act in this or that way or not. And understood even more correctly, one would have to say, I'm free when I actualize my capacity. And I'm free when I don't, do not actualize my capacity. Now, this means two things. If one grounds the freedom of choice in freedom as power, as a good Aristotle would do, or as Anna Arendt does, one sees that every actualization of a capacity is free. But then the reverse is also true. If I'm only free in the actualization of a capacity, not in having the capacity as a possibility, but in its actualization. So I'm only free in the actual, so if I understand, so that is the point I want to make, that if I say that only the actualization of a capacity is free. That also means that I'm only free in the actualization of a capacity. So freedom, the definition of freedom as a mere possibility would be overcome by a true thinking of capacity of power. The retracing of freedom to capacity is therefore seemingly paradoxical at the same time the overcoming of the capacity concept of freedom, the possibility concept of freedom. If we go back from freedom as a possibility to the practical capacities on which it is based, then we no longer understand freedom as a mere possibility. The return to capacity is the progression to the reality of freedom. Now this argument, this way of understanding of, uh, uh, criticism of freedom as indifference as a mere possibility, understands the conceptual error of the bourgeois ideology of freedom as indifference in such a way that it makes an internal moment in practical capacity, separate capacity, a capacity above or behind any capacity, a meta capacity. This capacity above or behind the capacity is called the will. 
By defining the subject through its will, it is thus understood as not being constituted practically, namely through its capacities, but as preceding all constitutive practical relations. Or the subject is not understood as made at all a secondary nature, for all capacities are acquired. As Frank says, freedom as a possibility becomes a given, we already heard that, the subject of the will is naturalized. So if I separate freedom as a meta capacity from the socially practically constituted capacity of the subject, I thereby naturalize it. This is the sense in which the bourgeois conception of freedom as indifference can be called ideologically, as Frank explains. It conceals the precondition of free choice. This precondition is, as we have seen, capacity or power. The bourgeois ideology of freedom of choice conceals thereby or therefore what underlies all choice. Being able to choose means having capacity or means having power. Only those who have capacities and power in every sense of the word, practical, economical, and political, are able to choose. The ability to choose is itself a power based on power. The bourgeois ideology of freedom is the operation thus of invisibilizing the condition and conditionality of power for choice. Frank, that this ideological up, uh, operation, the abstraction of the will from capacities, takes place in reality. It constitutes, we already heard that, social reality. It is, I quote, the reductive and reducing operation that produces the very nature to which it reduces the worker. Thus, the operation that makes cap capitalism, one could say, ontologically possible. This ideological operation produces beings without practical capacities. Having such capacities, however, defines the human being. The ideological operation of reduction is thus a dehumanization of the human, a desubjectivation of the subject. It's, as Frank says, it's animalization, the production of an abstract, unnatural animal. The book closes with the program, um, and Martin Laden already referred to that, of a step out of the necessary critique and towards overcoming the criticized. The liberation of this step is the subject of another book. But already here, Frank points the direction in which this should go. He says, with recourse to a formulation by Alain Badiou, quote, that the concept of indifference must be split, unquote. To split indifference means something else some, something very different from merely leaving it behind, like the first strategy of critique I just summarized would claim. To split, to differentiate and break up indifference rather follows from the inside that leaving it behind is exactly what rationalism in neither of its three versions discussed in this book is not able to achieve. So neither Descartes, nor Kant, nor Hegel, that is uh, Frank's point, is really able to make a step beyond indifference. For, quote, is and remains a problem in the history of rationalism. This is the closing remark on, of the Kant chapter. The relation between rationalism and indifference is thus not as simple as it might seem at first. Rationalism is the opposite of the freedom of indifference, is philosophical opponent, even enemy, and indifference recurses as a problem for and in rationalism that it cannot get, simply get rid of and solved. For in each of the three authors, there is a point in their thinking where they have to resort to indifference precisely in order to combat it. This has to do, I think, with decision, but this would be a longer discussion, the moment of decision in relation to indifference. For decision, as Frank explains with relation to Descartes, goes beyond cognition. And the crit critique of indifference, as Frank shows with reference to Kant, is ultimately a moral decision against indifference and for morality. Hegel then acknowledges this explicitly. He acknowledges, as uh, Frank shows, that indifference persists. Now, from this insight that indifference returns as a problem in the rationalist attempt of overcoming it, indeed that the thought of indifference is reconstituted in each act of its critical rejection, it follows that the very idea of overcoming indifference, of leaving it behind, must be put into question. 
the Badudian Im imperative, the concept of indifferent must be split, to which Frank subscribed from the insight that there can be no solution for the problem of indifference, or that the solution consists precisely in the reappearing of the problem, or rather that the reappearing of the pro problem has to be and can be turned against itself. In one form, the reappearing of the problem of indifference is simply what it is, the failure of the attempt to solve it. In the second opposite form, it is the very form of success. So the reappearing of the problem and the possibility to solve it is the successful solution. To split the concept of indifference means to critically distinguish between two ways of its returning as a problem even in and for rationalism. As I understand the program with which the book more or less ends, this also has consequences for what critique, namely ideology critique, means here. In the first understanding, which I had, have constructed in the first part of my remarks, ideology critique is the step from indifference to capacity, to spirit, to practice, i.e. the step beyond indifference. Ideology critique here means overcoming indifference but tracing it back to practical capacities. This strategy of critiques comes with a political program. Its name is socialism. Socialism is the politics of abolishing capitalism by going back from the illusionary ideological freedom of choice which bourgeois law legalizes and which capitalism realizes to the basis of the real practical capacities on which capitalism in truth rests. Socialism thinks the overcoming of capitalism is the liberation of capacities from the freedom of indifference. Socialism leaves indifference behind and creates a society based merely on capacity on practical power. If I understand correctly, Frank does not think that. Frank is not a socialist, at least not in this sense. He's not because he does not want to restitute practical capacities against the freedom of indifference. The program of splitting indifference, because indifference by necessity returns in the attempt of overcoming it, is quite a different, is a quite different operation and understanding of critique than the ideology critical step from illusion, freedom of choice to truth, practical capacity. Rather, it means to understand and practice the critique of indifference as its rescue. Critique as the rescue of illusion, as Adorno put it, Rettung des Scheins. It means radicalization. A rescuing, however, does not mean preservation. It doesn't even just mean sublation. It means, as I just said, radicalization. The illusion or phantasm of indifference becomes true not by relativizing it, by inscribing it as a moment into a larger totality, giving it, giving it its due little place, but rather by absolutizing or exaggerating it from ontic to ontological indifference, as we just heard. This is also what the book teaches us about overcoming capitalism. If capitalism is a social order that realizes indifference as the capacity of a thereby animalized humanity, then the overcoming of capitalism is not the founding or refounding of society on the practical, spiritual powers of man, but rather by radicalizing its powers of indifference beyond the very form of capacity, but truly liberating indifference from capacity, from capacity in any form and sense. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christoph. Very powerful and uh, uh, very rich. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Slavoj, we'll... Pass the screen to you for a last salvo. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Sorry. I want to begin. Don't be afraid. I will not go crazy. It's my usual insult, which is the highest praise, which how much I hate Frank. Why? He's as evil as Alenka Zupancic. I published a book of Antigone. I thought, oh, oh, I can go to sleep now. It's the definite version. Then Alenka published Let Them Rot, which ruined my reading and forced me to make a step further. 
And now I'm close to conspiracy theory. Then I published a book on freedom. I thought now I can go to sleep. Look, look, Frank is here with another book doing the same. What I'm trying to say in very vulgar way is that it's really a shattering great book. So quickly, quickly, I will jump up and down some remarks. Uh, uh, Frank, uh, the point where I would, it's not even correct to say disagree, but kind of uh, take a slightly different approach is, if I understood you correctly, you emphasize this spirit, spirit not, not as another substantial entity, but spirit as this self-made a product of its own activity uh, of its own activity beyond nature and so on and so on i'm tempted to say that to go to the end in this direction nature should also no longer be conceived as what in long history including the 19th century determinism we called nature Nature is not natural. We learn this from Einstein on quantum physics and so on and so on. I know there is a great danger here. And Frank, as a good Stalinist in theory, that's what I highly appreciate, would immediately detect this. That to say what I said now oh, may open up the way towards new age uh, pseudo Buddhist or Hindu, whatever, reappropriation of nature. For example, even Zeilinger, the Austrian who confirmed important things and got a Nobel Prize in quantum physics, all of a sudden we discovered he's the personal friend of Dalai Lama. He thinks uh, nature is not only reality. But so again, I would say don't just presuppose nature there. Your radically new notion of freedom, Frank, retroactively compels us to rethink the notion of nature itself. Second thing, maybe shocking to some of you, uh, you know, I heard so much, and of course I agree, capitalism, freedom reduced to natural level, I mean, to a natural capacity in freedom, it's the uh, freedom, capitalist freedom reduces us up to socially produced animals and so on. But I remain a Marxist here. At the same time, we have to go through capitalism, through capitalist indifference to arrive at this, under quotation marks, highest indifference. So capital. this is the basic idea why I remain in this sense a Marxist and reject all that bullshit of, you know, like I have friends in Latin America who claim, oh, yes, Incas were maybe sacrificing children, but you know, down the Amazon River, there is one tribe which really offers an alternative to us today. No, I am a Marxist here. We have to go through capitalism. Next point. Here I am. Uh, uh, mixing you, Frank, and you, Mladen, and I will just try to make, I wonder if you will agree with this, my small contribution, this question of ontic ontological. Uh, yes, I agree with you, Mladen, we should leave it behind, move over, but how? Let me first take, although I'm ready as you, Frank, if I got you correctly, uh, to take Martin Heidegger very seriously. I'm absolutely not ready to dismiss him as if now fashionable as a Nazi in philosophy and so on. But nonetheless, I was pretty much horrified when in a letter, I don't know if it was 47 or 52, so after World War II, uh, answering the question, but aren't we Germans nonetheless obliged to feel guilty for guest chambers and so on. You know what he does? It's quite ingenious in a horrible way. He evokes ontological difference. He says, yeah, yeah, grausame, gas cameron, guest chambers, they are still ontic crimes. But the true horror is 
that through American and Allied occupation, the whole of Germany is now a big concentration camp deprived of its free spiritual acceptance or in of spiritual event, accepting it. So uh, what I distrust, and it's not just about Heidegger here, is how we find at other levels also this apparent radicalization, which uh, apparently moves an empirical complaint to ontological level, but really mystifies everything. For example, now I'm now out of Heidegger. I read recently an article against what one cannot but describe as the metaphoric universalization of the notion of decolonization. You know, if you read latest humanities, you almost forget that what decolonization really means. There are countries which were colonies, and then how should they acquire independence, economic freedom, and so on. Now, now uh, everything should be decolonized. You have uh, uh, decolonizing school, decolonizing methods, decolonizing student thinking, and so on, and so on. Uh, uh, another case here. Uh, uh, recently at Birkbeck, I was in a debate with some ladies from uh, South Africa, and not me. Jacqueline Rose asked them, what about all these rumors that, uh, you know, rape? rapes exploding in South Africa. And the answer was shocking to all of us. But wasn't apartheid and your coloniza uh, colonization of South Africa one big rape of the entire country? So what right have you <laughs> to accuse us of, OK, the, of these antique thousands of rapes and so on? And my ultimate example, it's sadly comical, I remember, I was suspecting it, how fashionable it was some 30, 40 years ago to criticize uh, the uh, clitorodectomy as horror happening in Africa. But then I also don't agree with the reaction of some Africans, which was, but aren't plastic operations of, we, uh, of women's bodies a kind of a universal clitorodectomy of, of the entire body and so on and so on? That would be my uh, reaction to this. Let me go quickly so that I don't talk too much to another uh, point. Frank, uh, would you agree that... Uh, with all your critique of freedom of choice and so on, that one of the ways, nonetheless, to apparently reject choice, but which is a secret, terrifyingly wrong choice, is did you notice how in the two big wars that are going on today, big from our point of view, there are other that we ignore, horrible uh, military conflicts. That is to say, Ukraine and uh, uh, Israel, Gaza, the strongest part, uh, Russia, Putin's regime, and uh, Israel, Netanyahu and his right-wingers who are in power now, they both present their act as with the preface, again and again I hear this, Sorry, it's brutal what we are doing, but we really had no choice. We had to do this. No, we there. Do you agree, Frank? We should insist. No, you had the choice there. So, uh, next thing to provoke you a little bit, and then already the conclusion. I will really try to be not too long. Uh, you know, our friend Alain Badiou, which was often mentioned here. Uh, and I like this with him. He tries to avoid the easy, for me, too easy. Would you agree? Etienne Balibar's notion of ega liberté, condensing in one word equality and freedom, like in English it would be free quality, <laughs> something like this, totally. But uh, and uh, but I although. But you, against the bourgeois ideology of freedom, would prefer equality. I think 
provocation to you, Frank. I think that it's time to remind ourselves that Marx himself, and I think with totally correct argumentation, rejects the notion of equality. He considers this a strictly part of a bourgeois project. We all remember Marx's vague poetic taken as a paraphrase from uh, Holy Scripture's definition of communism, from each according to his ability, to each according to his needs. But this statement has a fundamental presupposition. Human beings ha have unequal abilities and unequal needs. And I will not go into it now, but in his critique of Gotha program, Marx has an entire passage on rejecting the notion of equality. Now, allow me to conclude with my favorite part, which will be totally crazy. I was trying sincerely to think, Frank, about what you very convincingly describe as this bourgeois society of free choice, which is really a new form of slavery, uni universalized indifference, which all the time, of course, puts forward free choice, uh, differences, and so on and so on. My good friend from South Korea, Alex and something, I'm never good with those names there, uh, told me that if Kozhev were to be alive today, you know, for Kozhev, first it was Soviet Union, Hegel's end of history, then it was Japan, and uh, Alex told me today it would be South Korea. He told me that the new generation there, not young, young, people in their 20s, 30s, even early 40s, it's a kind of a really predominant, you shouldn't be deceived by these protests here and there, but it's a globalized political indifference. It enjoy your daily regular life, do even extreme things, take drugs, orgies, blah, blah, blah. But it's totally depoliticized indifferent plurality. Uh, in some sense, this is so perverse that it's getting close even to some form of fake socialism. And uh, Alex convinced me that the opposition of North Korea and South Korea today is maybe the axis which at its most radical we can see where we are today. South Korea is this banalized freedom of choice brought to the extreme. People don't care if you mention there Julian Assange, oh, who is that? Okay, no problem. I sign a protest letter and so on. Who cares? It's kind of a general human rights don't matter. It's just live a modest life, enjoy it, and so on. But there is one phenomenon there which I would criticize as part of this consumer indifference. But it fascinates me. Maybe there is something more in it. Do you know what is now exploding in South Korea, slowly penetrating also United States, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, Germany, and so on? Uh, uh, their term is Web Social, the novel on the web. People, and by people, I mean millions, no longer buy books. You have a mega network, tens of thousands of authors who publish books on the web, one chapter every week, and they get millions of lead, uh, readers. Just to give you an idea, do you know that this uh, uh, web uh, social novel on the web, three, four co companies dominated, uh, turns around more money than Samsung, the symbol of uh, South Korean economic success. But you know what's so fascinating is that 
it's no longer a culture in the old sense. It's very conservative at the level of literature. It's mostly genre. Detective, romances, which is why women predominate as readers of these novels, uh, uh, and then science fiction, uh, and so on. Second point, it's serialized every week a chapter, and the other reason is that it is, uh, it is uh, interactive, you know. Like, you can, although you don't know mostly who the author is, you can write him and or her, uh, and uh, then you can even make an influence. Authors listen to this, change the story, and so on. It's a unique, almost, I would say, really unique, uh, really unique collective process. And here it's true that the manipulation of the company, there are three or four companies, it's much lower than that of Google and so on. It's really kind of a wild self-organization, tens of millions of people operating. So uh, I see some weird potentials here and help me to decide. I am basically horrified by this. This is what Frank was describing as this postmodern indifference horror at its purest. But at the same time, my God, there is some kind of a weird collectivism here where really creation becomes a social process and so on, which is incredible. And to give you just uh, another, the last, uh, 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 the last uh, uh, concept of this, uh, uh, the last story, another example. Do you know that the same thing is happening now in Gaza? You know where Gaza is winning the war? Israel, in is Israel's side, the state tries to control the stories by endlessly repeating those thoughts from the, uh, from the iPhones of Hamas. Uh, raping women and all that stuff and so on. But we got tired. Well, do you know that there are minimum a couple of thousand Palestinians in Gaza who have iPhones and regularly post on, I don't know what networks, their daily experience, and some of them have a following of that goes into millions. You know, you get connected to a guy there who said, you see up there, it's an Israeli plane. Will I be bombed or not today? I don't know. It's a whole network. Tens of millions, hundreds of millions around the world are following this. So I'm glad to see an example of this, how should I call it, depersonalized or whatever you call it, structure, which Actually, maybe I'm undecided here. Help me, Frank, give me the party line. I cannot resist think maybe something positive in it. And let me now conclude really shortly. I return to my traumatic experience. It's Pate, that Frankfurt speech, uh, book fair, blah, blah. You know what I found? And this concerns freedom, Frank. You know what I found most disgusting there? I accept people think I'm anti-Semitic, blah, 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 stupidity. But you know how many people, over 30, I counted them. I will, of course, not name them. Well-known publicly people who, some of them even attacked me publicly there. In private, it happened regularly. Like, I meet them on a corridor. They look around. Nobody's there. And they whisper to me, you know, I really agree with you. I just think it was not the moment to say it. But I totally agree with you. My answer is, and here, Frank, I come to freedom. That's our freedom uh, today. There, uh, what they mean by it's not a moment to say it, it means to today or at that point to say it did have some real effect. Their message is, Say it, but when we will be sure that it will not have any real effect. And this brings us also to basic 
inside of Hegel, of in spite of all their differences, Freud, Lacan, that it's not enough to tell the truth. The truth to be an act of freedom, telling the truth has to be done at the right moment when it will have the effect of truth. I'm sorry if I was too long, then thanks very much. Thank you very much, Slo. I know I, that was that was uh, uh, very precise. We've we've hit two thirty, so I'm going to leave Frank with that burden. Frank, can we try to finish at two forty five? Is is that uh, is that going to be possible for you? I'm 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 just going to single out a, a few moments, and and I'm going to try to speak to the uh, vast array of um, I think wonderful, and I'm very grateful for for everyone uh, to to everyone who who. Um, um, for for all the comments, I'm just singling out things, and um, um, and and hopefully um, they 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 speak to what um, everyone was um, pointing out. And I'm just going to go um, um, in the in the order in which we started. So, um, like maybe maybe two or three uh, quick comments to what what Rebecca Rebecca indicated. Um, I mean, yes. Um, in difference of repetition, yeah, a pun on Deleuze, you're absolutely right. I mean, yes, um, the, the idea is obviously that, um, um, well, I mean, to 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 modify mildly um, um, the, the Kierkegaardian slogan that maybe indifference is a, is a new idea at, at one point, right? Not repetition um, in, in modernity. And and so, so, so maybe modernity has something to do with, um, is something, like an age of indifference and that strangely coincides with the birth of modern rationalism so um my my endorsement of modern rationalism which also includes i mean if if you see the look at the 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 follow-up book or the sequel um uh, systematically a, a project like psychoanalysis right? i mean freud would would always describe psychoanalysis in in uh, fully uh, endorsive rationalist terms that there is something like um, a product of modernity that is that pre-modern myth of that's somehow 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 remains remains I don't know pertinent um, maybe one could say of um, freedom as a given. So so the, it's not like simply the idea that modernity um, um, needs to shake off its pre-modern roots or whatever. I'm, I'm I'm not saying that, but I'm saying. Modernity comes with its very own invention of a pre-modern supplement, and that sort of manifests in in the conception of freedom that it, one can identify as um, um, in 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 the very idea of uh, a givenness a givenness of um, um, freedom in the form of natural capacity. Is that Adrian Johnson once raised the question? to all Salarsian critiques of the myth of the given, if one should not uh, against them um, um, formulate a, a, a myth of the ungiven. Uh, and I see that uh, on, on, on some level, um, I, I, one, one could, I, I could read your question in that direction. I know that that was not your question, but I could read your question in that direction. And um, and I would say the myth of the ungiven. It, 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 I mean, right? The 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 the. Um, I'm I'm not endorsing this, but I'm basically saying without a theory of the constitution of freedom, one does not have a theory of freedom. That's that's a modern insight, it seems to me. Um, so so one has to say something about how freedom comes to be what it is. How and that is more that is, I mean, in, in, in trivial terms, a theory of the actualization of freedom or the coming to be of freedom or the I mean, as, as I just said, of the of the constitution of freedom. I see um, that you that you uh, thought I I I I bought into market related um 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 questions vis-a-vis -vis the, the vis-a-vis -vis the preface but um um I don't only talk about Sylvia Federici and Angela Davis I also talk about Lenin um the whole uh, book begins with a Lenin slogan uh and um um has a quite uh, I think Leninist um endorsement certain percent um I, and I'm not sure if that is really, really, really 
selling more uh or uh, you see what i'm trying to say and um but 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 i think the the very important point you raise um um and that that i um um i i want to address and i think it it would absolutely deserve a far more elaborate articulation um than i have um thus far given it is the question is um the form of um, broadly speaking, what Marx calls wage slavery is still the same. Uh, is is op still operates in the in the in the same way or doesn't? Um, I mobilized Ferrigian Davis um, to point out to to point in 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 two very very different directions from what I do in the book because the book engages um, uh, directly rather uh, philosophical counts. But my, I mean, but I think it's a real question if 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 there is something like neoliberalism uh, or if we're still uh, um, um, in a liberal framework. Um, I mean, put differently, if Marx's account needs to be um, transformed and uh, re-articulated or, or if maybe Marx's account was science fiction for actually the years in which we're in which we're living, um, 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 I, 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 I just very briefly, briefly, briefly continue um, with I think um, um, two or three comments about what Mladen said. Um, I think the 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 points um, um, where let's say an ontological or ontic ontological indifference makes collapse the onto ontico ontological difference um I, I i find i find and i find i find very 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 um um entirely entirely convincing entirely convincing and so forth as one could say that um so i begin i, I try um, uh, um, pointing out in the indifference book that there is a reading that Sartre provides of um, Descartes where Sartre sees two sides of indifference but doesn't know how to square them and he sees that in 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 in, in Descartes um, and 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 I think Hegel offers an interesting an interesting answer of how to relate those two sides somehow and these the coincidence I think that you're pointing. Uh, that you were pointing out with with um with the let's say Horatian situation uh, that that seems to be the condition of thinking somehow right I mean when one raises one raises in, in indifference to um to a point uh, maybe one could say indifference to the point of impossibility or whether to coincide and that that is sort of how I mean in in the Hegelian framework how how thinking emerges um and and that that has has to do everything I think with with um the constitution of all the the I think important words uh, that in Hegel begin with end uh right Entschluss and lesson right that 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 that's where where exactly these 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 um coincidences I, th I think happen um with um, regard to what I think, um, and and there, I mean, there's much more to say about all of this. But with regard to what what Christoph said, um, um, in this sense, I I I I I couldn't agree more that the attempt is um, a radicalization of indifference. There is no other. I mean, it is not an attempt, and that 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 bears resonance on the one hand side to what. Think what Mladen, what Mladen said, right? Uh, the 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 uh, the that the, 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 the ontico ontic uh, or ontic ontico um, or ontological in, indifference does something to the um, um, ontico ontological um, difference. It, it it collapses this in a in a different way um, because there is no way um, in in which um, 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 it's similar, I think, to what Slavo said at the very end. Um, one could bypass going through indifference. So the right, I mean, it's not like that. There was Slavo's point at the beginning. So the, the Marxist point, right? I mean, it's not like um, 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 there there is any any way of returning to a universe of difference under present conditions. And in this sense, um, but I, I I couldn't agree more. I think with what Christoph said, um, um, I. I'm not a socialist. Um, I, I'm. I, I really am not a socialist. Um, 
because um, the the attempt to radicalize indifference um, 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 does not try um, to mobilize any form of given natural capacity that is sort of obscured, alienated, or whatsoever. It rather thinks exactly the other way around, uh, namely from um, that alienation is so constitutive um, that we cannot but think under this 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 very condition. And that means, I think, um, like um, similar um, to 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 um, um, if I if I just briefly um jump on two points um um that 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 what is to be learned um from the complex operations of naturalizations that are linked to the idea that freedom is a capacity or a matter capacity that is constituted by relations of power um means ultimately that that there are two two types of very abstract production um, in place on, on that front. And one is the animalizing production, uh, the production of, let's say, that kind of human animal to which we're then reduced. And Marx says a, a lot about um, um, the um, animal body and the 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 the, the animal that in the in the in the in the in the um, in the um, uh, eyes of uh, political economists or workers, but on the other hand side, there it is exactly at that point where another kind of production might be possible, where another kind of production um, um, might 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 um, actually um, transform. Um, 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 the very idea of how 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 let's say political organize, organization uh, might be what, what political subjectivity is or what it even means to be able to do something. I mean, so the very idea of capacity might be changed exactly on that front. Um, um, and I think that that I think has um, um, direct bearings on um, the points that I think Slava made, but because. Um, I I I emphasize very much that that the signifier. I mean, Lenin has this wonderful line, I think, in 1918, where he says, "Under capitalism, we should never ever use the signifier of freedom equality, and it's even more dangerous to use the signifier dictatorship of the proletariat, right? Because and and he he calls the latter he calls them a holy word. He basically says, "Never let's use the holy word because the more we use them." People get accustomed to them, habituated to them, and the more they get habituated to them, the more they become disorienting under conditions where there is a discrepancy when we describe what we're in, um, a, a, a discrepancy between, between material reality and how we represent it. So in this sense, one could say um, um, something very similar to what I, 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 I was uh, trying to point out vis-a-vis uh, -vis the signifier of freedom that it becomes, I mean, and that's that's one could say is is also an insight that Lenin um, um, speaks uh, very directly to. Something very similar happens also to the to the to the other signifiers uh, of um, that pertinent in uh, the French uh, Revolution. So constitutive, one could say, uh, of a certain understanding of modernity, namely equality and broadly speaking solidarity. They 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 also also start operating in a very disorienting or disorientating way. Um, um, and, and just a very, I'm, I'm ending on this now, um, just a very spontaneous um, um, a reaction to the South Korea example. I mean, um, it seems to me, um, and it's different, for, uh, it's, it seems to me um, the, the the question is who's in charge uh, there? I mean, who's controlling, very, I mean, who's controlling exactly uh, the framework in which these types of collectivization um, happen, um, and um, um, and is is that collectively determined or not? Um, with regard to um, the the I think the 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 book book fair thing. I mean, uh, as as you know, I, I I arrived a few days later, and we did uh, a thing together. Um, 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 but, I mean, but, but, um, I did not even think that. 
what you said was um, that radical, to be honest. Um, so, so I, I, I thought you were um, surprisingly, surprisingly mild overall. So, so in this sense, I, I think there there is something interesting in the way in which you actually, by being mild, hit on something that produce these kinds of effects. Um, so so one does not have to even go go too far sometimes uh, to produce these kinds of reactions, it seems to me. Fantastic. Uh, Frank, that was impressive. It's, uh, <laughs> you did it 15 minutes. Um, I, I'm reminded of uh, our experience last uh, summer when um, you had three days and we were under similar pressures. Um, but I want to point out to everyone that we're going for a repetition this summer in Sasfe. Um, and that is to say that uh, both Frank and Maladen will be teaching, will be leading seminars. Um, these will be uh, drawn together then uh, after four days in a in a discussion with Slavoj, um, so I I, I mentioned this um, to, to, so that people that, that might want to consider joining us. You can you can actually take the course or audit, uh, but this will be in August, and I'm afraid I forget the exact dates. I think it's around the fourth of August. Twelve like to twelve to fifteen or something. Uh, 12, or nine, thank you. twelve to yeah. Thank you. Um, so that's yeah. So there will be a repetition. We'll have to determine what that what that produces at the time. Um, I I can't thank our, our, our participants enough. Uh, um, this has been a wonderful wonderful uh, uh, discussion, a powerful discussion, and I'm I'm just very very happy that we're able to uh, to have such a thing. And um, with that, let me simply uh, wish all of you the very best in, in, in tough times. And, um, and I look forward to seeing you in, in other events. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much, everyone.